everyone and welcome to this Outdoor Classroom Day webinar, which we're very excited about because we're just two days away from the big day itself. Um, my name is Amanda Horton Master and I'm the Chief Exec at Semble and I wanted to thank all of you for joining us, whatever time of day or night it might be for you, because there are people here from all around the world. I know that for Australia and Griffin in particular, they're normally the ones who get up in right in the middle of the night. And uh, finally, we're doing an event that works for Australia and New Zealand and makes the rest of us really appreciate what you normally go through to satisfy the rest of us. So thanks to everyone. And for those of you who are in Canada or in America, wow, it's really late or the middle of the night for you. So thank you very much for joining us as well. So just a tiny bit of history. Outdoor Classroom Day was originally set up by Anna Porch in 2012. And it's been running now um, for the, we've been, Semble has been running it now for the last five years. And with huge thanks to Unilever, who have been our sponsors for all that time and have also supported um, this webinar this morning and obviously Outdoor Classroom Day on Thursday. So huge thanks to Unilever. And Learning Through Landscapes are our wonderful partners here in the UK and we are co-hosting this webinar today with Learning Through Landscapes. Now at Semble, our whole and entire purpose is around driving positive change from the grassroots up. So we're delighted to be working with an amazing grassroots network of over 100,000 schools, teachers, parents, all around the world. It's a wonderful thing to be part of. Now look, um, getting slightly more serious, obviously over the last eight months, there have been very, very few countries that haven't had to introduce some form of restrictions on our freedom. And those restrictions are absolutely still going on and affecting many, many millions of lives. And we've all seen the effects of lockdown on the negative effects on both the mental health, the physical effect of all people and especially on, on children. But I think it's also clear to see that as that freedom has been taken away, it's massively driven this appreciation of the outdoors and how special and how important it is to have that chance to be in the fresh air, to feel nature all around us in the skies, in the water and in the land. And, you know, I'm, I've been working at home since March and I can hear every time the children next door get up to go and take their dog for a walk and put on their wellies, the squeals of excitement that come from them all because this is what's exciting for them. So I just think being outside and we all know it unlocks so many things in us and gives us a chance just to breathe more freely. So Outdoor Classroom Day has never been as important as it is now. The whole ethos of taking people outside. Children who are outdoors get sick far less often. They're more active, they're less stressed and they love both playtime and lessons outside. And we find their teachers are often happier too. So we want to grab this momentum. We want to really scale it up by helping teachers and parents have the tools and the confidence to be able to take children outdoors and really spend time learning and playing in the space that we know is safest for all of us in this current and complicated time. So I think our shared objective is to ensure that children have the chance to get connected into nature, become happier, become healthier, and grow up, most importantly, wanting to protect our planet. And goodness knows, there can't be anything more important than that. So we need to get outdoor play and learning on everyone's agenda. And Outdoor Classroom Day really gives us a great trigger point to have these discussions and make sure that that message is heard loud and clear. So this webinar is really a chance to share the practical experiences and the best practice to really expand beyond expand the uptake and to get more children spending more time outdoors all around the world. So on that note, and welcome again to everyone who's joined, I'd like to start us off by handing over to Kath Prisk, who's the Global Partnerships Director for Outdoor Classroom Day. Over to you, Kath. Welcome, everybody. We have got an amazing lineup for you. Um, Outdoor Classroom Day has been a joy and a privilege to be part of for the last five years as we become more and more international. We've got primary schools signed up to add a classroom day in the Yukon, in Patagonia, in Mongolia, in small islands scattered across the globe. And very importantly, in Scotland, in Australia, in Bangladesh, 
in all across the UK um, and all across South Africa and of course huge numbers in Turkey and so we're looking forward to hearing out from a really international lineup. Um, here in the UK we're going back down into lockdown in um, a couple of days and so it really makes us think, I'm sorry, here in England we are going back down to lockdown. Mary's going to, to, to correct me on that one. Here in England, we're going back down to lockdown. And it makes us think about yeah, the last six months has been really interesting. At one point, 90% of school of children worldwide were out of school. Now it's it's still millions of children are doing distance learning, blended learning, but the outdoors is available for everybody. So whatever you're doing on Thursday, do encourage as many schools as you can to get involved in the outdoors. It is my pleasure to introduce to you, first of all, a Scottish minister for children and young people who has been championing children's rights to be outdoors for years now. And I'm really looking forward, Mary Todd, um, looking forward to hearing from you and what you're gonna to say to us about Scotland this morning, where there are over 2,000 schools signed up to Outdoor Classroom Day. Thank you, Mary. You have to unmute yourself. Sorry. <laughs> That's so 2020, isn't it? <laughs> so good morning, everyone. I'm uh, competing with a Don Chorus here in the Highlands. So um, it's wonderful to be with you here. I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to take part in today's global seminar um, for the Outdoor Classroom Day movement. And thank you, Cass Prisk, for inviting me uh, to participate. And I really look forward to hearing from my fellow presenters. The Scottish Government um, wants Scotland to be the best place in the world to grow up, uh, a nation which values play and outdoor learning as life-enhancing daily experiences for all our children and young people, whether that's in their homes or their nurseries or schools or communities. And all children and young people have a right to experience play and outdoor learning. They're vital for a young person's development and health and well-being. And both of that, um, all of that is reflected in Scotland's curriculum, the Curriculum for Excellence. In the Curriculum for Excellence, we have a framework through which outdoor learning and play can be used to deliver education in all curricular areas between the ages of three to 18. And we encourage teachers to engage with motivating, exciting and diverse outdoor environments through continued support provided by Education Scotland. That's our agency uh, responsible for supporting quality and improvement in Scottish education. We've also taken the really important step of embedding um, outdoor education in, in outdoor learning into the curriculum with the theme of learning for sustainability. So Scotland has a world leading reputation in the field of sustainability education and we recognise that contact with the natural world will help our young people to understand the importance of environmental sustainability. Play and outdoor learning encourage problem solving and working together at a really young age. It promotes independence um, and autonomy for the teenage years. Children's play and outdoor learning are absolutely crucial to Scotland's well-being, um, socially, economically and environmentally. And our children learn as they play and experience the outdoors, helping to foster their natural curiosity and motivation to learn. We've often tussled with um, play pedagogy and those words and whether it shouldn't be inquiry-based pedagogy because it's so obvious that that way of being outdoors and following your curiosity is, is clearly a good way to learn. Play is a fundamental part of children's quality of life and it's a right that's enshrined in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Article 31 states that children are entitled to take part in physical activities and to play including outdoors and to have an opportunity to experience and judge and manage risk. 
the Scottish Government has a responsibility for implementing the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child in Scotland, and our play strategy aims to create and enhance those fundamental building blocks that enable and inform a more playful Scotland, where children can realise their right to play every day. Now, this includes improving the play experience for um, of all children and young people, including those with disabilities or from disadvantaged backgrounds, aiming to ensure that um, all children and young people can access play opportunities in a range of settings that offer variety, adventure and challenge. Now, the Scottish Government's committed to incorporating the UNCRC into Scots law this uh, year of Parliament, and we are working with the play sector and other key partners to ensure that our children and young people can realise their right to play and um, experience the outdoors every day. Through play, children and young people can explore the world around them in a creative and engaging way. We know it's important for their growth, their development and their well-being. We know the benefits of outdoor learning, exercise and play for children in terms of their health and well-being, physical and cognitive development. And there's a growing body of evidence that shows that children with higher levels of outdoor play have improved cognition, which can result in better academic performance and contribute to closing the attainment gap. And I have to say just anecdotally, I visit a lot of outdoor nurseries. I have mainly have responsibility for under fives um, learning. And I was astonished at the language acquisition in, in some of these outdoor nurseries. And I, and I pondered a lot on that. And I thought, actually, when you take the walls away, you have to stay in continuous communication to keep children safe outdoors. So there's no doubt in my mind, it's very clear that language is one of the very obvious and definite things that improves, but it's not what people imagine when they think about um, how play um, might help your learning. Play and outdoor learning, as well as all the learning positives, are absolutely essential parts of a happy and healthy childhood. And you know, when we all think about some of the best times we had in our lives, they'll be outdoors. Um, when children experience play and outdoor learning, two things happen um, to their brains. Their brains grow and they become better organized and more usable. And children become more active, more confident and more able to develop the key skills that they need for growing up and, and being contributing members of society. Now, it has been a very tough year, as we all know, globally. So. Throughout the pandemic, um, the Scottish Government have been working very closely with the play sector to try to support families with play and learning at home during lockdown through a range of channels. We have a parent club website um, and we've had lots of social marketing campaigns, which included advice and information and resources aimed at supporting families to cope with being at home together for long periods. And play has been at the forefront of our messaging for um, just it's, it's a means of helping children to adjust to the changes that they're facing in their lives. Um, it helps them with learning and it leads to positive interactions within the family, as well as making transitions back to school and to nursery um, easier after a period of restrictions. Now, in May 2020, we provided um, the actually quite small sum of £159,000 um, of funding to live in classrooms to expand its virtual nature school program and it has been the most phenomenal success. So the work provided um, professional training and learning materials to early learning and childcare practitioners, supporting them in delivery of high quality outdoor play and learning. And children and families from right across Scotland benefited from outdoor um, play sessions during uh, our lockdown period. So during the time when they were unable to access their normal ELC settings. And during that programme, 16, week, um, 16 weeks it ran for, more than a thousand ELC practitioners were trained to deliver child-led nature-based learning experiences, um, supporting the early learning of over 40,000 families. So as I said, a very relatively small amount of money to have such a, a profound impact. Um, 
On the 14th of July, we launched the Community Play Fund of £400,000 to facilitate organised outdoor play in most some of the most disadvantaged communities in Scotland. And the fund will support 23 different charities across Scotland for organised outdoor play activities, equipment and clothing for children and young people to help as many as possible to get back outside, to be active, to make friends and to have fun. We've also been working very closely with the play sector, including Play Scotland and the Smart Play Network and others, to provide non-digital support to vulnerable families, including physical play packs and materials for different age groups um, of children. The activities that, um, that are within the pack range from group work to individual work, with some involving ch play channel challenges and a choice of um, freedom in the a completion of them. So all of those are key characteristics of play identified in the play strategy. Um, the pandemic has proved um, sadly to be a challenging time for outdoor education providers, particularly those who offer residential visits. So, um, you know, this sort of places and there's so much evidence that this is beneficial to children to go on a, a week's holiday in an outdoor residential place. But obviously it has proved difficult during the pandemic to have um, overnight stays um, because of health um, constraints. So the Scottish Government's taken some action to support the sector during the coronavirus pandemic. On the 27th of, 22nd of October, we announced a two million pound fund to support residential outdoor education centres, which were facing financial pressures as a result of the pandemic. And that funding will help to ensure that children and young people right across Scotland can still continue to access immersive, um, fun and curricular um, relevant outdoor learning experiences and it will complement ongoing action aimed at supporting outdoor learning. Uh, for example, this year we've uh, provided £7,000 for the development of comprehensive guidance for schools and local authorities to, um, to go on day visits to outdoor education centres. We also gave £27,000 to the, fund the development of professional learning and guidance to help teachers and non-teaching staff to get the skills and confidence um, needed to take learning outdoors. As well as that, we facilitated regular sessions um, between, so regular discussions between the outdoor learning sector and local authorities. And we're still trying to do that to foster connections between those who deliver outdoor learning and, and those with responsibility for delivering education um, in Scotland. And the aim is to encourage more schools to link up with their local centres to arrange day visits and support um, so that the, the, the outdoor centres can come to them and help them in their school grounds. Outdoor learning and play are absolutely vital in enriching the educational and social development of our children and young people. The work of the Scottish Government has ensured that our children and young people can continue to um, experience these benefits despite the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. And I want to reiterate the Scottish Government's commitment to this agenda and our desire to ensure that outdoor learning and play are not just delivered on outdoor classroom day, which of course they should be, but every day for the benefit of all of our children and young people. Thank you very much for having me along. Thank you so much, Marie. It's so good to hear that the Scottish Government is supporting that vital outdoor learning sector because it's like, you know, we always talk about outdoor learning and play being every day with experiences on their doorstep, in the community and big adventures too. And they're all part of the rich curriculum. I'm going to move on to Australia now, um, where over a million children have got involved in Outdoor Classroom Day and over 9,000 schools, parents and supporters have signed up to the campaign to make outdoor learning and play part of every single day and particularly to celebrate on the 5th of November. Um, Griffin Longley 
is the chief executive of Nature Play Western Australia, where over a 30% of the primary schools got involved in the campaign. Um, he's an award-winning journalist, a former weekly columnist with the West Australian newspaper. I only just learned that, Griff. Um, and also the very much the, the very um, charismatic lead for Outdoor Classroom Day in Australia. Um, Griff, over to you. Thank you, Kath, um, and thanks to the team at Sambal for all the work in getting this campaign going. I mean, it's a, it's amazing for us to be able to just sort of step into it and, and have this vehicle um, that enables us to connect to so many, so many children, so many schools, so many teachers. And it's astonishing to us to, to see the appetite, that latent appetite for this kind of program, this kind of message. Um, so yeah, I'm speaking to you from Western Australia, for those of you who are elsewhere. Um, so Western Australia, just really quickly, we would be the 11th largest country in the world if we were a country, um, but we're just a state. And I raise that because where I'm really speaking to you from is from Wadjuk country in the Noongar Nation. So um, the Aboriginal um, custodians of this land have been here for 60,000 years, doing an incredible job. And that connection to place and that deep understanding of care for country and the use of the word country here is more it's not a, a political word it's a it's a place word um, so where I'm sitting is on the edge of the Swan River or the Derville Yerrigan and the very spot where where our office is was a teaching spot where where elders would bring young people to the river's edge and they would teach them how to fish and how to catch the crabs and how to catch the prawns but for 60,000 years, that transfer of knowledge um, was done and it was done in the outdoors. It was done in a, a tangible, emotional, kinesthetic way. So I, I raise that because this is a really modern thing that we're part of here. You know, here we are on Zoom talking around the world, but it's also an incredibly ancient thing that we're talking about. And I think it's important we don't forget that. And it's, um, it's also a sacred thing. I mean, this is this whole idea of, of driving and promoting the time and the space for play is sacred work. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a, it's a core human inheritance that, you know, if we don't pass it on, um, we really are robbing generations um, to come. So, you know, it's, ancient, it's modern, it's sacred, it's, it's fundamental. Um, but I wanted to put up a few slides and just, just talk just very quickly about um, the situation that we're in um, and how outdoor learning is in many ways a solution for it. I'm just gonna see if I can bring up my presentation. Bear with me. All right, I'm hoping you can see that beautiful bird, can you? So this is an Azua kingfisher. Um, there are kingfishers all around the world, but this is one that's found in Australia. I bring this up because in 2007, the Oxford Junior Dictionary removed the word kingfisher from the dictionary, from its junior dictionary, along with the word nectar and acorn and willow and a series of nature words and replaced going into the dictionary in that same year was um, chat room, celebrity, bullet point, cut and paste. So we've got this shifting in our knowledge base and you know, language evolves and that's a fantastic thing, but there's so much to be, to be gained from retaining these, these ideas and these moments in our children's lives. See if I can move through this presentation. Part of what this is all about too, and part of why outdoor learning is, is so fundamental is that it's a way of not only connecting with the outdoors, but with each other. And I brought up this slide just to share with you that there's some research done in the US um, a few years ago now, looking at the impact of screens on, on language use. And it found that in households where screens were used a couple of hours a day, that those households would speak on average 6,000 words to each other. Um, but in households where screens were on all the time, whenever anyone was home, those households would speak 500 words. 
So we go from an individual speaking one and a half thousand words a day, sharing their experiences, parents communicating to children what it means to be a human being, what it means to share and be, be in a world with other people and other species even, down to 125 words to do all that important work. And we think about you know, the, the challenges that educators are facing. And then we recognize that we have children coming into school spaces whose language environments are impoverished. And part of what the outdoor classroom day movement is about is giving ourselves a chance to actually connect with each other, to share experiences and to have things to talk about. So it's not simply about um, you know, using the outdoors to learn math or, or whatever it is, which is all very valuable, but it's also about much more than that. But this, this kind of reductionism going on in the experience of childhood that I think we need to be aware of. Um, this slide that I've just put up too is it's just a different kind of reductionism that, that's happening. So what we're looking at here is a, a Google map photo of the, the, the city, the town that I live in called Fremantle. And the black dot near the, uh, the river there is where I lived when I was 10. And I've marked in that green circle where I used to walk um, without my parents at 10 years old. And then near that, you can see another black dot and that's where I've marked where my children lived when they were 10. And then I've marked where they were allowed to walk without us, without me and my wife. So there's a, across the sort of the spectrum of, of the generations we're seeing a reduction in words, we're seeing a reduction in walking and connection to place, just walking that ground, recognizing species, recognizing neighbors, having the, the emotional and creative journey of stepping outside of your house as a child and moving through a community and through a place. So we're seeing this kind of steady reduction and, and part of what this movement is about is, is saying that that's not okay and to, to find ways to, to, to bring antidotes forward for these kinds of reductions, albeit that we live in a modern world. And then we come you know, to 2020 and, and that reduction has gone even further. So if we were to do a similar map now, we'd just be looking at black dots and we'd all just be our black dots with our limited, you know, in Western Australia, thankfully we haven't been as limited, but around the world, people have been and I think it's worth pausing on it for a moment and, and considering that the trauma, the global trauma that we're suffering by is largely one of being confined to the indoors, of living our lives more by technology than by experience, of having our opportunities for freedom reduced. And is it worth pausing and, and acknowledging that that's kind of a reflection of modern childhood? So the COVID experience that adults are, are suffering by is probably the closest experience adults have to the typical child's experience in that children can't walk out. If children walked out and, and walked to this corner and saw that sign, that would be their normal thing. People would say, why are you on your own? Why aren't you supervised? So I think you know, the COVID moment is fascinating in that way, but we are still seeing dramatic reductions in mental health outcomes. So um, some studies recently showing doubling of depression related um, illnesses and the doubling of stress related illnesses, reductions in hope. One study um, asking children about their levels of hope and, you know, from June to the year before about a 34% reduction in hope. What's interesting to me about this also though, is that at this very moment when we're being challenged and when so many of the things that are um, important to us, you know, the things that we sort of hang our life off are taken away, the routines, you know, the, the entertainments, all those things, what is it that we long for? What is it that we miss and that we need and it's connection to other people. It's being outside, it's being in our community, it's being able to go and see our family. So it's kind of an interesting moment in that way too, in that it's kind of stripping away all of the, the bits and pieces that get in the way of what's truly important. And those bits and pieces can dominate our lives. 
it's been fascinating to watch too, the way children at every opportunity have been breaking out of their houses um, and they've been doing it creatively. They've been connecting to their community. They've been seeking ways to be in nature. And we know, you know that nature is, is not just the national parks. Nature is everything around us, even indoors. You know, the plants and the dogs and the, you know, the flies here. Um, but it's all in us and, you know, the, the two kilos of um, bacteria in each of our guts, you know, horrible thought, but we are largely bacterial. You know, we are part of nature and we are a host for nature. But we know that nature impacts um, our health and our mental health really directly. And there's lots of research to show that. But I actually wanted to talk to you very briefly about a tangible example of that at work, and it, all this relates back to, to learning. And this is a, a wonderful woman called Maren Lindheim, who I met in Oslo a year and a bit ago. So Maren is a psychologist at a large urban hospital dealing with some of the, the worst trauma cases in, in the country, in Norway. And um, she started using nature to help treat children in her care. Um, so seven years ago, she began the process. It's now been looking to be rolled out at hospitals around Norway. And essentially the children are, are taken out, they're wheeled out on gurneys sometimes, wheeled out onto a bridge across a stream next to the hospital. And they fish off their gurneys into this stream and catch fish. And then they all sit in the snow. Actually, I've got a, a picture of the little bridge that they fish from. And they'll go across into that tiny little patch of forest next to the hospital and they'll sit down and in that time the children build the optimism that's required for them to be a part of their own, to take part in their own rescue, to take part in their own treatment. And when they do that, when that moment is allowed them, when the trauma of being stuck inside in a hospital is, is removed, they're finding some remarkable things. So the use of restraints, you know, physical restraints and chemical restraints in the hospital have died since they started this program. Um, children are spending less time in their beds. They're getting out of hospital earlier. They're willing, not only willing, but they're actually keen to come back for their follow-up treatments because they've had a good experience at that hospital. And what's happened is that it's unlocked a part of them that's really fundamental. Happy to say that here in Western Australia, we're um, looking at start a similar exercise. You're looking at a picture of our new children's hospital, which sits next to the largest inner urban park in the world called Kings Park. Uh, and there's going to be a bridge in 10 months put across between the two. And we're looking at ways to, to bring that health experience back into nature and nature back into the hospital. But I want to just pause and talk about, so why is it? Why, why does nature have this impact on us? And I think it's worth bearing in mind that, you know, as a species, we've got terrible blunt little teeth. We're slow as anything. We can't fly. We're weak. You know, if you, any, any animal on the planet's got a power to weight ratio that will put us to shame. What allows us to survive and to thrive is our ability to communicate and to work together. We are absolutely a community-based species. And it's, it's what makes us who we are. But that comes with, with a sort of a double-edged sword because what that means is that our human relationships are what determine life and death. They are the things that keep us safe. So as a result of that, when we're in a human environment, when we're surrounded by other people, when we're in a, in a building made by human hands and posters on the walls, everything in that room is speaking to our success or failure in being a part of that group that will enable us to survive and to thrive or not. And that comes with stress. You know, our, our ability to succeed as a human being is at play in that situation. And that raises our cortisol levels, it raises our stress hormone, it makes everything, um, gives them weight that it doesn't necessarily need to have. When we step out of that human environment and rather than facing across 
face to face each other, we're shoulder to shoulder, sharing an experience, all of a sudden our senses dial up and our brain chatter dials down and our ability to coordinate and work together escalates because we've removed ourselves from that deeply intense human environment and we're now working together in a natural environment. So it's kind of the perfect cocktail for humans to be at their most effective. And it's no surprise. I mean, going back to the fact that I'm here in, in Wajuk country where for 60,000 years, people have worked together to survive in nature. So it's, it's how we've evolved. It's what we need. And it's what allows us to succeed. So when we're, when we're doing outdoor classroom day, when we're taking our outdoor learning and play, um, you know, our learning and play into the outdoors, we're doing more than just stepping out of the door. We're unlocking our humanity. We really are. And we're dialing into the things that allow us to relax and to succeed. Um, and that's, that's fundamental work. So in this COVID time, while that's being closed down for people, we're feeling its absence. And I think it's, it's a moment we need to embrace and we need to work through and we need to remember it because this is a, this is a lesson moment for us. And I think it's one that, you know, that there's a real opportunity to take incredible positives forward from and into the rest of our, our lives as adults and uh, our lives around children and, and for children themselves. So that's, um, that's what I wanted to share. Griff, that was beautiful. Um, reminds me a few years ago, we were talking about the purpose of education as part of a select committee, a UK select committee group talking about the purpose of education. And that built into a wider international conversation and picked up uh, the Children and Nature Network. You, the purpose of education isn't to release children into the world sort of clean and unharmed uh, with a bit of maths and some history. It's to support children's innate ability to be who they want to be, to be the best they can be and to connect with their communities and to grow up to be able to be great parents and great mm -hmm. um, parts of their uh, leaders in their community and to support their elders and to create spaces that are wonderful for their neighbors. If the yeah. purpose of education is, is all of that, then surely this reconnection with the outdoors it has to come central. And if there's one thing that's great, you know, the, what's happening at the moment is showing us you know, the children who stayed indoors and had no connection to anybody over the last six months or, or to very few people. You know, they, there are many in countries where they, they had a strong lockdown, where they're seeing the effects now on children. And here in the UK, we were encouraged to go outside, but I know I did a, 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 a survey and found 10% of the people who responded to our survey didn't go outside at all apart from for essential journeys. I think we're going to find what you've just been talking about is absolutely critical. We are a community species and it is sacred work that we're doing here. I'm gonna turn now to um, Sully Serti. Sully, um, I've had the joy of working with for a few years now, um, Active Yasem, that she's the chief executive of. Um, hell, uh, they, they, they ran the International Play Association Conference over in Turkey a few years ago. And that's when we, we got to realize just the amazing work going on across the huge country of Turkey. I'm really looking forward to hearing now about how outdoor learning and play um, is so important for your country. And especially you're saying, you're talking about the recognizing the importance of outdoor learning in Turkey after COVID-19 pandemic, through the COVID-19 pandemic. And particularly looking at how some parents, some teachers, some carers have embraced outdoor classroom day during the quarantine. Sully, can I pass over to you? 
Yeah, thank you, Kat. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Shule from Turkey, uh, and I'm the vice chair of my association, uh, Aktif Yasham. It's Active Living Association, actually. And our mission is, uh, and what we do is to make people from uh, to toddlers to elders uh, to make people uh, move during their daily lives and be healthy and a health, have a healthy lifestyle. So our target groups are from all ages and all genders are from everywhere. Uh, but uh, children uh, in development age actually are the primary uh, target group of our association's work. And we are conducting some projects since 2008. Uh, we established in 2008. And uh, when we established, uh, we had a partner, uh, a private sector partner and the Ministry of Education. Uh, for five years, we conducted a project and it's called uh, Let's Play. Uh, and the need for this project came from uh, that the, the, that time in 2010s, I think, uh, we had a regulation that allows people, uh, allows schools to make profit from their uh, gardens to use as parking lots after school time and during school time. So uh, it was a disaster. <laughs> it's really, uh, it was a really bad regulation. So we, we, we said that the gardens should be uh, children's playground, not parking lots or not anything else for children's playgrounds. So we conducted a project that turning these gardens to playgrounds for children. And uh, it took uh, five years and we just reached uh, 50 uh, schools, uh, 500 schools in 50 provinces. Uh, and after that, uh, for, and at those times, uh, we just really got into play because we found out that uh, the play is the natural and the best way to make children move and to be healthy. Uh, so that's what uh, we started to focus on when, she, when it's uh, coming to the children. And just uh, in the beginning of the panel, uh, I just picked a pencil from my uh, pencil box and here it is. It's Play Scotland. <laughs> And just Kate uh, just mentioned that uh, after that, uh, we just met, we went a lot to UK, both Scotland and England, to learn about play and how it's uh, going on and what the vision is. Uh, so um, after the uh, project, we met IPA, International Play Association uh, in England. Uh, and uh, we became Turkey branch since 2015. And we were the first country to uh, take the accreditation uh, after uh, hosting the conference <laughs> in Istanbul. <laughs> and actually at that time, we just received the accreditation and we were hosting the uh, conference and we had an amazing uh, participants from all over the world. And we listened everyone from uh, around the world and how it's going on with what play. Uh, and it was a really um, mind opening thing for us in Turkey and for both of us and for the participants of the conference. We had a lot of academicians, teachers uh, and carers, guardians and everyone uh, was joining the conference. So that's what we learned from uh, our physical activity and pain, play uh, connection. Um, so uh, in every project, we are uh, focusing on children much more. Um, for Turkey's uh, perspective of play, uh, we were the only one uh, talking about play back then when we had the conference. And we thought that we should uh, make an agenda about play and try to create an agenda in both uh, ministries and teachers and schools, administrators of schools, uh, we should uh, create an agenda. So we started to doing some work with uh, policymakers, uh, society, teachers, and everyone. And when we are actually when we are conducting the Let's Play project, something else happened too. 
and and the play starts uh, being recognized in Turkey. Uh, I wish I had some uh, developments to tell, but it's very still very new to our country. The play concept is very new, and we are trying to uh, push it uh, every other day, every other year, uh, and every other project that we have. So uh, it's little. It's still baby steps for us about play, but uh, when the, during the Let's Play project, uh, we had the Ministry of Education as partners, and that's a, a really hard thing to do in Turkey about bureaucracies and everything. It's really hard. And when we are conducting the project, we had a physical education in primary school back then, and the ministry uh, just decided to turn the name of the, and the context of the uh, physical education to play and, uh, play and physical activity class. So that's the uh, one change that we are a little bit proud of <laughs> with the project. Uh, so we are trying to make still create, to, uh, create an agenda. Uh, and when we met uh, Kat uh, and uh, Back then, Project Dirt, uh, we are really uh, excited to do this, uh, do the campaign around Turkey because we had never had a campaign before that we speak all over the country to all the people uh, in the uh, country. That was very new for us. It was 2018. And I remember uh, just a small memory of mine. Uh, my colleague, we were just uh, making a contract uh, with Sample back then, and the contract asked us to uh, foresee a number of uh, participation from children. Uh, and we were just, I don't know, how, how could it be? We were never done this before. We never asked people to join a movement uh, in social media and for remote uh, communication. And I just take a guess that I said, 200,000 children will join in this first year of this after, after classroom day in Turkey. We uh, worked with schools a lot back then, but we were always just one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we were talking, uh, we were there, we were with them. Never ever had that communication remotely. So I said 200,000 and my colleague just said, wow, you really think that it's gonna be, it's gonna happen? I said, I don't know, I feel that. And the first year, uh, our participation number of children was uh, 500,000 from Turkey, all over Turkey. We had just one city didn't join the, in the first year and all other eight provinces were in there and bo um, in both Turkey and in Cyprus, uh, we had participants from there. So that showed us that our teachers, administrators and everyone in education uh, just confirmed the need that they had that they need a space to support the current uh, education system because that's not enough for them they are always looking for new ways new methods uh, new uh, subjects to talk about to do with children because they are uh, the the system is uh, the system is done. It's uh, it's not uh, giving children anything anymore, and they need to. Uh, then the idealist uh, teachers are looking uh, looking ways to do something different. So that showed us that confirmed the need that the first year confirmed this need to us, and we and we so uh, we understand that we are on the right way. And in the first year, um, I wish we had. Uh, some more, much more natural spaces, forests and green areas and public spaces. But uh, in most of our country, it's much, uh, it's big cities and metropoles and everywhere. In Istanbul, especially, it's schools between uh, narrow streets and all around buildings. They don't even have a garden to play. Uh, so it was a bit challenging for us to say go outdoors and just be in the, be at nature. Uh, so uh, in first year we, we said that okay, just go outside, take some fresh air. Uh, just what do you do? Just 
be outdoors. Even you can be in nature, you can be in your garden, you can be your balcony, you can be anywhere else, but just take some fresh air, take some uh, outdoor, uh, just see some outdoors. So in first year, we had to make this flexibility because uh, this is a very diverse country and a very crowded country, actually. We are 85, 85 million people in here. So we had to uh, create some flexibility for teachers. In rural areas, in the first year, in the rural areas, the teachers at the rural areas uh, just felt so proud and happy uh, to be recognized because they are always in nature and they are always doing this outdoor learning but they have been never recognized before. And no one knows that they had some cows and chickens uh, around schoolyards, or they are just always, they, the, their classroom is always in the nature. So uh, the teachers felt really connected to each other in the first year. And the second year, uh, we just pushed it. And the second year, we had a ministry of education just uh, indirectly supported the campaign and tell all the primary schools and uh, yeah, primary schools and uh, early education schools that they should go outside on 21st of May. Just indirectly, not, not having a protocol with us, just supported that because he's a, a play, he loves, very, he, he loves play very much and he believes in outdoor education. Just personally, he's an, he's an educator also. And uh, last year, our minister just gave a little push and we had a, a 7,500,000, 7, I think, uh, participation. And we hit 1. million, 1.5 million uh, this year uh, with that. And this year, uh, we just voluntarily uh, conducted outdoor classroom day on May. And because the pandemic uh, just hit really hard uh, in people for both children and adults and everyone. And we thought that we should do this. We should support them in any way we can. Uh, so in May, we had, uh, we just voluntarily uh, conducted the campaign. And this, uh, we first, uh, um, the thing we learned from May campaign is that before that we are talking to schools, classrooms, the whole schools and crowded places, but now, we, uh, we get into homes and talk to uh, individuals, the families. Uh, and we had like almost near 300,000 signups on May campaign. That's, that's a really, uh, that's all, all, also showed us that uh, we are in the ro uh, right way to make uh, people feel some uh, goodness in this year <laughs> and feel some uh, happy joy in their lives um, and now the first uh, time in three years we are now participating in the November campaign we never done this before but uh, these three years and this pandemic uh, really showed us that people not just educators or parents educators or carers guardians everyone who's working with children really needed some solidarity really needed some support and really needed some recognition for what they've done. Because it's it's a junction actually with news and everywhere. Uh, and it's really, really hard to be heard. Uh, and we just create a, created some place for them to make, to show their work, to show what they've done. Even if, if it's a very small thing, even if it's a, a half time, a, a, uh, one hour of their day, uh, but uh, we just uh, saw that I hope in the future is after learning. And by the way, the, with the pandemic showed us, uh, I have so little time left, I think, so I just cut it off. Uh, we just people just uh, saw that the outdoors and physical activity for both them, both of them are really, really, really very much important for a healthy life for both children and adults and elders and for everyone. So this pandemic uh, showed us that not to us, but just confirmed our uh, messages that we have, we have been giving for since 2008, uh, confirmed the messages that we, uh, we are giving to the people that you should move and children should play. It's not a gift, it should be a right. 
uh, it should be given, not just a prize or something to make them feel happy. Okay, you play now, not this, not like this. They, they should, they should be their rights. They should be already given to them. Uh, so uh, we are uh, continue. We will continue to our work to make play and outdoor learning an agenda to create an agenda in Turkey. Hopefully, we will uh, achieve some goals, a little or big ones. I don't know. I'm not sure, but we are actually we are hopeful that something will happen too. And maybe in the future we'll meet again. I will talk about some policies. I will talk about some developments, uh, and I will talk about some uh, schools that are in nature. I hope. Thank you so much for listening. And for all the other uh, panelists. It was really in inspiring, by the way. Griffin, you really inspired me a lot. And Marie, I am very envy you, really, really, really so much. I hope Turkey will see this <laughs> development too. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julie. Thank you so much. <laughs> It's like, I really hope that maybe me, maybe you can inter introduce Marie to your Scottish, uh, to your Turkish minister and they can have a conversation. I would love this. that. Because the issues of rural schools in deepest northwest Scotland and northeast Scotland are not dissimilar to the, the, the issues of rural schools in deepest Turkey. I yeah. love that you just said that they're so connected, that they this campaign helps connect the rural schools across the country with the urban schools. Yeah. I'm going to quickly move on. We are over running out of time, but they, but Matluba, I am so excited to hear from you. I, Matluba is from um, Bangladesh, has her just got your PhD. So Dr. Khan, um, I believe, um, is working in Cardiff University. She's going to talk to us about the design of outdoor learning environments and the implications for the children's learning, their health and their well-being. Matluba, can I pass over to you, please? Thank you so much, Kat. Um, and, and thank you so much for inviting me to this panel. I'm just so pleased and, and inspired by all the uh, presentations um, uh, from uh, Marie, Sully and Griffin. It's, um, it's really inspiring for me um, uh, as well. So, uh, so I wear a, a designer hat and a researcher hat. So what I always like to do is um, uh, uh, to, to research what uh, the implications of design and particularly in case of outdoor learning, what, what design means for, um, for outdoor learning and what is the kind of, what is the implications for learning health and well-being. Um, this also comes from my previous experience when I went to ministries and, and the secretary um, told me that I'll bring some evidence uh, that outdoor learning really helps, bring some evidence that outdoor learning really boosts um, academic attainment. Um, um, so I, I'll just, maybe my presentation will uh, cover some of this that will give that confirmation that well it works and um, uh, and the experiment shows that so I will um, briefly share my screen uh, can everyone see my screen I guess um, the, the practice of outdoor learning is, is actually very core to the culture and tradition um, in, um, in, in the Indian subcontinent in Bangladesh. And of what was once practiced is actually a school is just two students um, sitting under a tree. So it has always been practiced outdoors um, before uh, the formalization of the education system. And when we thought that the the school um, building will offer more, a content uh, place will offer um, more to children than, than the abundance of um, the natural resources um, um, outdoors. So this, this 
um, quote is really like I really like um, this um, unattributed saying uh, that how uh, we do not really need a lot to actually teach and learn. But also, it, it, as I was saying that I was actually taking this photograph um, to to um, to Department of Education. Um, to, so the, this was part of my master's project in Bangladesh, um, where I worked with children to develop uh, to build this outdoor amphitheater, um, where they were taught um, their regular uh, maths and science classes. Um, um, and uh, it's uh, because I, I, I come from a context where almost 100% of children now are enrolled in school, but the, they do not achieve their standard competence level um, at the end of like, at, uh, at, uh, after they complete their primary education. So it's, it was a challenge where, where teachers already struggle, where teachers struggle to, to put the kind of curriculum first and to also make sure that children achieve their standard competence level to prove that, well, if you take it outside, the still in, children will, will, will achieve their standard competence level, even they will do even better. So that was my mission for my PhD, which uh, I should just say, I have a just strong connection with Scotland that I did my PhD at University of Edinburgh. <laughs> and I, I co-founded a charity there, a, a place in childhood um, with amazing colleagues um, that is based in Scotland now. Um, so for my PhD, I really looked into whether outdoor learning can improve children's academic attainment and well-being, and whether a place um, designed for both pedagogy and play can actually improve um, uh, children's academic attainment. Um, so from my observations of different school grounds and in countries, it's uh, uh, that not always outdoor environment actually supports the practice of teaching and learning outdoors. Although I, I was saying a bit earlier that it doesn't take a lot, but what it takes is actually careful thinking in terms of what can be there and what we can, um, um, how can we design it that can support the teachers as well as um, students. So the hypothesis that I have been working on was that an environment that, is, that has been designed as a combination of different behavior settings or that offers uh, different kinds of learning areas. Uh, and so it, it, will, um, even, uh, it will offer different affordances for um, cognitive, social, physical, and emotional activity that will eventually lead to increased physical activity, improved learning, and increased opportunities for play. So, so I so what we, need, we need to design the environment that can offer opportunities for both pedagogy and play. And uh, so I conducted the experiment in a school, in a primary school in Bangladesh, where we had two groups. So I'm just in introducing the groups in a way. So one group who was exposed to outdoor learning. So, uh, so I, I um, I worked with local architects uh, and my, so I'm an architect and local architects and we co-designed with the community and, and children. Um, this school ground, which you can see now barren. Um, and, and we had two groups in this school after, after the school ground was finished, uh, the design was finished and, and the construction was completed where one group was exposed to both outdoor learning and outdoor play and uh, one group was exposed only to outdoor play. Uh, and then we compared it against another school where no intervention has happened. So the children were learning as usual in their um, usual classroom environment. And so, as I was saying that we co-designed it with children. So children drew what they wanted in their school ground. And, uh, um, and also they gave, gave us useful insight in terms of what can help them learn in their classrooms. So not necessarily it's always uh, the teachers who will know how to teach, but children will also will go, can give insights in terms of how that how they how they can be helped in in the teaching and learning. Um, so they, they built models. Um, it was a child-led model making workshop where children actually worked with teachers, and they negotiated with teachers in, in terms of where some things some. Uh, some elements could should go where some learning areas should be built, and um, that was a very kind of 
uh, say, it, that was also a learning experience in terms of when teachers are saying, well, would you like the garden in front of the classroom because you might have the kind of um, the fragrance of flowers or so all, all these kind of um, uh, other e experience was also coming into place in addition to kind of not only thinking about the pedagogy and playing. Um, and uh, we work with the teachers, we brainstorm together in terms of what can be there that can help them teach sciences, teach maths, um, outdoors, um, uh, teach other subject areas. Um, a teachers think even literature can be taught outside as, as, as Marie was saying, the, the language can improve like, so much, li the literacy. Um, and uh, and I, if I would not have worked with teachers, I would not have known that how new more numeracy can, can be taught outside and how, uh, uh, um, how enlightening, uh, this was an enlightening experience for me. And we presented the ideas to the school, um, uh, to, the to, to the community um, uh, and us and the community came uh, forward with, with their ideas and what they can help um, in terms of building the school ground, how they can help uh, with resources, with the labor. Um, and, we started building um, the school ground. So the, the local masons and the carpenters were hired and, and children worked together with the local masons and uh, uh, carpenters. And, uh, and we all, all worked together to build the school ground. So you can see it's, it's, the school ground was quite barren um, and devoid of any other uh, resources except there are three trees. So now we have the school ground with, as a combination. Uh, so it, it, it was not a very large school ground. It, it, is, it, it was a very small school ground when, when the whole area is 0.33 acre of land. And, uh, but we had this um, several behavior settings which were in interconnected. So I'm saying behavior settings, which also children were term, giving terms as like learning areas, which offer diverse opportunities. And they were all around an open year. Um, um, so you can see some of the photographs at different taken at different stages, but these were different settings which were used uh, by teachers um, uh, to teach different parts of the uh, to teach um, uh, maths and sciences. Um, so this was the school before um, so it, it, it didn't give the like whole view, but um, uh, some some part of it. Um, so this school ground was. Um, it was. Um, a, it has received accolades by American Society of um, Landscape Architects, so ASLA Honor Award, and also ADRA um, Great Places Awards. Uh, but for, uh, uh, but that that only uh, has has uh, that the main thing was that when the school round, yeah. So when it was finished. Um, um, the children are placed because they were listened to because not only they were asked what they want to have there, but they actually could see what uh, that what they wanted to have actually could be there. Um, uh, it was quite it was empowering for them that uh, and then they after the school ground was finished, the children have their uh, classes, um, uh, their maths and science classes for the purpose of the experiment. Uh, regularly outdoors for um, five months. Um, and afterwards, the, the school ground was open to all classes for their, uh, for their classes. I guess what, uh, and so the experience was um, playful, um, the learning to uh, make, so as opposed to the image on my left hand side, it was um, experiential and it was playful. Um, um, and, um, and so I, I, I had the opportunity. So I've been there um, every day just to observe as, a, as an observer how, how children were uh, uh, experiencing um, the environment, how teachers were teaching. So um, it was a mixed methods research, well, experimental research with mixed methods, but also uh, I had this ethnographic observation. So it, it employed as many methods as possible <laughs> to, to, well, um, that, that, that is not a very scientific way to say, but uh, yeah, well, it applied multiple methods to capture the holistic picture of how the school ground design has 
influenced um, the teaching and learning process and impacted um, uh, their learning and well-being. So I, I measured it on, on several, uh, so this was um, uh, evaluated on several measures, but I'll, I'll just present some. Uh, just say in, in how it's relevant to pandemic in a way, because generally the classroom size is like this, um, uh, where 30 children are taught in, in a classroom. Um, but if you can see the, the same experience when you take two outdoors, how we can actually use the whole school ground um, to teach them in small groups. Uh, but, so the, here they are not only learning, um, uh, to like learning to experiences, if you say social distancing, so everything is possible there in light of them and pandemic to actually to take it outdoors. So this, I think this behavior map, which it, well, these are pictures from my sketchbook in 2015, but in 2020, it's just so relevant that how we can take it outdoors and how we can um, um, teach children, which, um, which would be more, uh, fun and uh, experiential for them. And if you look at the playtime, like the, the school round, this is, um, these different colors actually uh, indicate uh, different types of activity. So we can see that, that there are more colors after interventions. So children were engaged. Uh, uh, this is an accumulation of a week's activity in the um, before intervention and after intervention and children were engaged in more diverse um, activities and uh, of course, and also num the, the number and intensity and diversity has increased um, significantly after the intervention. And if I have to say, so the academic attainment part, so the treatment group, uh, which who, the group who was exposed to both outdoor learning and outdoor play has significantly, um, um, uh, they performed in, in their maths and science um, uh, exams uh, significantly more than the comparison group and control school. Um, but also then comparison group was exposed to the outdoor play um, in the kind of design school ground um, has shown improvement um, in their maths and science course as well. Um, you can see that because um, uh, but at the same time, you can see that for the performances of the control school, that was similar before and after intervention or even went down, whether the performances in the intervention school that improved um, over time uh, after intervention. Um, and it's in terms of the impact on teachers, like how, uh, so the teachers told me that they were a bit first, a bit hesitant about taking classes outdoors because also in Bangladesh, this not necessary. The school primary schools in rural areas they didn't have, they generally don't have boundaries, um, so or fences. So they are all um, quite visible to all the all the um, people surrounding the school. So they're hesitant to take children outdoors, where the, the activities will be actually quite visible to everyone who are passing by the school. And so the teachers were a bit hesitant, but then. Uh, afterwards, uh, when I was speaking, so on some on one day when outdoor class was happening, and a, a, um, a villager was passing by, and he was telling me that, well, I call that real learning, um, where the initial perception was that the community will not take it positively, but they were saying like, uh, and the the villagers felt like this this was transparent to them. They could see that their children are actually learning. So their children are not only jam packed in the classrooms, but they're actually doing things and they're learning. And uh, even though the literacy rate is really poor in that village, but they could feel that the real learning is happening. And many of the parents say that, uh, that some of their children actually go to so uh, uh, private schools who who can afford that. And but they, they said that their children are now saying their parents that they want to go back to government schools. So this is a government primary school. And because they could they could feel that, that the experience is there, they could see the experiences there. And, and children think that teacher is more fun and, and out of the classroom. Um, and she has, and they also think that she has more things to work with 
to to make the learnings work like teaching work for the students um, and the teachers themselves um, um, felt like that they are thinking more about how they can um, um, make learning uh, more enjoying for uh, the children and more how, how they can use the different because they're different um, elements and so they can use different elements in different ways and they're just um, uh, the uh, the teaching and learning process are more um, are diverse now with, uh, with different elements and and the thing that it, it work not it, it doesn't work it never works in a linear way that the design school ground has a positive impact on on kind of in, increased motivation for children increased motivation for teacher and that actually have an impact on teachers like as makes positive change in teachers feeling and behavior and that leads to better quality teaching um, and better quality teaching leads again to kind of influences children's motivation that they are um, valued in a way so they they are given time and that um, and that leads to improved performance in, in children's exam so not necessarily so this is never a linear kind of um, way to say that can it, it, it is always this um, um, it has uh, like a, a kind of cycle or virtuous cycle that, that actually one influences the other and and the impact is just even greater um, in, in this case. I guess these are, um, I'll, I can f I'll finish there, but I, I could say that uh, I went on to, and later on I implemented, um, I worked with colleagues in UCL and some other organizations in London, and we implemented uh, a gardening intervention in a London primary school. And we looked into physical activity and children's mental well being, and also their in pro environmental behavior. Um, and there is also, the results are also published, which are, um, um, which I can share afterwards and share here as well. The children's physical activity increased, uh, their well-being um, improved, uh, and they have, they have become more uh, uh, aware of, of the and surrounding environment, and they've become more uh, uh, they're pro environment. So they're pro environment. So they. They want to care for the environment and they care for the environment and this, the whole activity of gardening and uh, caring for animals and plants actually made them uh, uh, contributed to um, making them like or, or say, to say like better citizens who are actually who become the uh, are stewards of, of, of the environment of the environment. So this is uh, thank you. Um, Um, I think the last thing that I wanted to say is um, uh, the the Bangla uh, Bangladesh has Bangladesh works with very few resources, um, and this uh, the, the the outbreak of the pandemic has been really difficult for low income countries who have to has to which had to find solutions with the few resources they had, and Bangladesh went on went on to find creative solutions using national television or multimedia classrooms or other. Uh, using mobile phones to reach children um, uh, to make this work for them to 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 keep them connected, but it, this this would be more of a pledge for me that well, whether Bangladesh can think that outdoor learning, adopting outdoor learning, could be a strategy for re, uh, reopening schools um, for children, and this can only um, and only help them when all the offices and everything is open. Uh, if the offices are open, I think the schools can be open too, and they can start. Uh, Bangladesh can think of bringing children back to school incrementally using outdoor spaces um, uh, for for teaching and learning. Thank you. You're muted, Kev. Is it? <laughs> You're muted, unmuted. It is the 2020 uh, <laughs> phrase, isn't it? Madeleine, but that was so inspirational. Um, well, that was that's what I call real learning. I think that's going to be one of my quotes. <laughs> like, because it's true. It's, we can see when children are outside really engaging. 
I think back in 2008, when I very first saw um, an outdoor play and learning uh, playground where there was lots of loose parts and children engaged outdoors in their play, it made me realize that sound of children, busy, excited, engaged in their own learning, responding to their own physical needs. That's what, it's how children learn. Learning is not just sitting and rote teaching, learning is fun. And I love that that chart you just showed about the it's never a linear way. It's always a virtuous cycle. I think that's something that we've seen in the Scottish, like in Stramash, beautiful examples from Scotland of that virtuous circle. And, and from Shirley has definitely illustrated that. We have a lot of questions coming in through both Facebook and through Zoom. Uh, we're not going to get through all of them. I'm going to bunch up the questions into a couple. We've got about eight minutes left so you've just got like about one minute to respond to each of these panel um the first one i want to say is um from catherine solly who you can also follow on on twitter and like is always a great speaker about early years it's like how important do the panelists feel that leadership of play and learning outdoors from birth to seven but also beyond is critical to outdoors so it's how important is leadership Alongside that, how do we measure social impact of outdoor learning? And do we think we're a little bit too risk averse? That question comes up every time. Um, I'm going to bring come to Marie first, if I could. Uh, thanks very much. I think leadership's really important. I think one of the real barriers we have in embracing outdoor learning, and I think that all educators know it's important. And I love that Griffin said it was sacred. You know, I think it, everybody instinctively knows that this is really important stuff. But there's something about um, what we're conditioned to expect learning to look like. And Matluba, you know, kind of hinted towards that as well. We expect to be in a classroom. We expect and, and, and you know, parents can often think if it's not in a classroom with a teacher, you know, imparting knowledge to a child, it's not really education. And I think these are some of the biggest barriers we have. And actually, as every panelist has said, just cracking on through those barriers and doing it, you reap the benefits almost immediately and you can feel the difference in what you're doing. So I think leadership is really important. Leadership is important in saying it's OK to do this. It's important in creating the environment where people feel um, supported to experiment and push boundaries and perhaps fail a little. You know, these things are really, really important to create a safe environment that people can do what... I mean, all educators know how important this stuff is. I keep, I think, you know, what is it that happens um, over the course of time that they then go into a classroom and do it uh, the old fashioned way? Because, you know, it, it's all just about inspiring children's curiosity. As I said, perhaps the language, you know, we've puzzled, I have puzzled a lot about this, you know, whether if we called it inquiry based learning rather than play pedagogy, would that help people to accept it? Um, and I'd be very interested to hear what people say, but I do think leadership's important, but the most important thing is the, is the educator's confidence, I think. Griff, Griffin, can I pass to you? Unmuted. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, just so inspiring, um, everyone, thank you. Look, the leadership side of it, I'm gonna put a slightly different spin on that, and I think part of our role as teachers and as um, adults is, is mentorship uh, and how we demonstrate, um, you know, everything from how we conduct our relationships, you know, to how we work um, to make things better. So, you know, if we're in a situation where you know, it's hard to do the thing we know is the best thing, how we demonstrate to the children around us how you work through that and how you remain respectful and how you engage and how you work and how good things come of that. So there's, there's leadership in the, in, the, in the effort as well as in the result, uh, I think is an important thing. And the other thing is I don't think we're risk averse. I think we're risk selective. Now, there's all sorts of risks we're very, very comfortable taking every day. Um, and then there's some that we, we're scared of. 
so there's sort of risk um, literacy that we that we need um, rather than being risk averse. I mean, every time we get in the car, every time we have a can of Coke, whatever it is, we're taking risks. Fantastic. Madluba, can I pass to you? Yeah, um, I think I, I'll take a maybe different route to the answer because I, I think outdoor learning actually can also create leaders. That's another thing that um, uh, the practice. So I, I'll just say one example from uh, from the London primary school where a boy who was uh, quite uh, quiet in, in the classroom and never participated. Uh, he, he went on to become a Boy Scout leader afterwards. So after one term of uh, working out, outside with, with the girl. And, and this inspired, inspired his teacher as well. She was very, uh, she, she's, uh, she's saying like, I, I didn't imagine that this, this, um, this, this magnitude of change um, will be happening where, um, uh, the teacher themselves were, were a bit um, less confident beforehand. We worked with an uh, outdoor classroom leader. Um, but then afterwards, um, just the, as I was saying, again, the, the, psych, the virtual cycle, the teacher saw this, the students change and the teacher also were becoming more confident. So I guess in order to be the leaders, we will also need to step outside first. And then, um, you know, that, that will... Um, um, it, it, the case of Bangladesh was we just needed to step outside and that just unfolded um, a lot of opportunities that we haven't imagined before. Let's say. That, that's perfect. Surely. Uh, yeah, actually the leadership is the, um, is the only thing that we are trying to create in here in Turkey, because when we had the conference in 19, 2015, no one followed us since then about play. And we really felt heartbroken because this is, I think we didn't um, uh, explain ourselves very much, as we thought, uh, but the leadership, especially in schools, and uh, it's very, I think it's very important. And now we are with the outdoor classroom day, we are trying to create leaders in every school about outdoor learning because uh, I think that should be achieved uh, the more the merrier uh, I, th I think uh, because it's uh, uh, it shouldn't be a one man's decision or, or one person's vision it should be um, it should stay there stay at the school even if the teacher or the minister or everyone goes away it should stay there so we are trying to create this leadership actually and we believe that this leadership should come from both teachers and from both parents the challenge the most challenging thing that we are dealing here uh, is also the parents because the risk taking is a very, very minimum and the, the children are just being raised like in a glass jar just uh, <laughs> nothing to uh, they just confront no, no problems in, in their uh, early childhoods in their development so uh, we are uh, we are working with teachers and schools but we have to uh, we are trying to influence parents also to uh, understand what we are doing here in school uh, and to do this uh, at their home uh, uh, also, because no matter what you uh, taught to your uh, to the students in school, and when they get home, uh, they see something or they hear some uh, something very different, and that shouldn't be that different from each other. So uh, we need leadership for from homes and for uh, from schools and everywhere. I really strongly believe that leadership is very 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 much important in early childhood. That's fantastic. It's, I think it's one of the key purposes of Outdoor Classroom Day as a global campaign is yes, if you've never done it before, get involved to, on Thursday, November 5th um, to have a go. And hopefully the day I know has inspired me in so many different ways. But for those leaders in education, whether that leader is a TA in a classroom, a class teacher, a head teacher or principal, uh, an education leader in a, in a local authority or municipality or in government or as an academic or as a parent who has a voice who can make change, you can create the environments for education and create the environments for play. You, I love the leadership in, 
the effort of leadership, the leadership in effort and the leadership in results, and that that outdoor learning creates the leaders amongst the children that we are facilitating and supporting. I'd like one or two words from each of you just on one thing a teacher can do or a parent can do on outdoor classroom day on Thursday. Sorry, Amanda, I'm going to go take us over time a couple of minutes. <laughs> Griff. So look, I think the, the primary thing is has been alluded to already and that's just get started. And I think it's important to remember that the perfect is the enemy of the good. Oh, Don't beautiful. Be perfect. perfect is the there. enemy of the good. I'm so, be Matluba. Be <laughs> perfect is the enemy of the good. Sorry, Greg. Keep it short. Matluba. I guess uh, i say that anybody can start with just a very small thing. So where schools are still closed, um, parents just can maybe just plant a tree um, or sow a seed. Uh, um, and just just go to the to the roof terrace or terrace or make the veranda as a kind as a kind of as an outdoor um, learning place. As, yeah, as, um, yeah, it's just um, just take the step outside. I think that that, that, that would be mine. Um, just take the step outside. Just plant the seed. Beautiful, truly. Um. Uh, and we don't have so much Turkish participants, I think, but we are in a really challenging uh, time uh, and the pandemic uh, and the other natural disasters and everything. Just make the day for yourself and make some uh, goodness. Just make some good just for yourself and your for your children on 5th of November. Oh, that's so beautiful. Especially in these times of stress, simply looking at a, a leaf make you feel so much calmer and yeah. more connected. Marie? I think I would agree with that. Just go for it, get outdoors, reconnect with nature and let it calm you. Thank you so much. Amanda, I'm going to pass over to you to wrap us up. Okay, thank you so much to everyone, to our fantastic panellists. I mean, personally, I want children to grow up in Scotland because there the government is doing such amazing stuff to not only give kids their right to play, but actually putting money behind it and making it possible. So that's just wonderful. And then Griffin, oh my God, yours was just so amazing. You took us down into the slough of despond with you know, all this talk of reduction in words, reduction in hope, reduction in connection to nature. But then you brought us back up with the hospital example. And, and I think you said something wonderful about how participating in Outdoor Classroom Day unlocks our humanity and allows us to dial into the things that allow us to relax and to succeed. So a wonderful message from you. And then Shuli, your infectious enthusiasm. I mean, my goodness, what you've been able to achieve in Turkey is amazing. And you know, you're know, you now creating an outdoor play agenda for Turkey, which is just wonderful. We're so lucky that you're in Turkey. And Matluba, congratulations, Dr. Khan. And I think your photos were wonderful. It was so inspiring to see what you were able to create with this sort of bare earth, the creativity that went to it. And I think everyone felt that whole idea of involving children in giving us their insights, because they know better than we do what, what they want and what they need. And I think, you know, thanks to all of you, thanks to everyone who's joined us today. I think it's been an amazing start for us in, in Europe, where it's the morning, but also huge thanks to Unilever for sponsoring Outdoor Classroom Day and making the movement happen and making this webinar happen. And as everyone has said, it just takes a small step. Don't have fear. Use the Outdoor Classroom Day website where there are lots of ideas and support to help you get started. And let's go forth and have an amazing day on Thursday. Thanks to everybody.